Dobar dan vsem skupaj. Good morning to everybody, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I would, I will try that after half an hour, everybody in the room will be convinced why this is absolutely necessary. What are the reasons? What are the obstacles? Why we have major opportunity? And if we miss it, where we will basically land? So, as Lede already mentioned at the beginning, it is about system change. And the structure of my presentation will be, first, I will try to explain you the world we live in and the challenges we are facing, then economic model driving our lives, the role of the circular economy, and finally, the leadership, governance, and the role of European Union in that context. But let us start with the world in which we live and the challenges we are facing. The 20th century is, uh, some are calling it the century of the great acceleration. By the way, I would like to explain one thing more. Whenever you will see on the left side this sign and on the right side this sign, it means that this is work on the this is presented on the basis of research work which is done by International Resource Panel. This is UN-based institution, like International Panel for Climate Change, which I'm currently chairing on the global level. So the population growth in the 20th century was 3.7 times. Annual extraction of construction materials grew by a factor of 34, ores and minerals by a factor of 27, fossil fuels by factor of 12, biomass by factor of 3.6. Total average material extraction grew by a factor of 8, and greenhouse gas emissions grew by a factor of 12, 13, sorry. As a consequence, we landed up in a world uh, which currently looks like that. Uh, this is the work of the Stockholm Resilience Institute, in which they have exploited and analyzed nine planetary boundaries and found out that in two of the areas, we are already beyond the zone of uncertainty in the high risk. That's how we are managing nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, and in the area of biodiversity loss. And in two areas, we are in the zone of uncertainty, increasing risk, that's in the land system change and in the climate change. If you think thoroughly, all four areas are directly connected to the way we produce our food. So, in the future, it will be a lot about how we will handle the food systems, uh, how actually sustainable world will be. Let us now go to the 21st century. We all got used to the figure 9.7 billion at the mid of the century. Let me translate that figure that you will understand what we are talking about. In one generation, you will have on the planet additionally 2.5 billion people. Over all amount of population 100 years ago was 1.4 billion. In one year, you have additional Germany on the planet. In four years, additional United States of America. In nine days and six hours, Slovenia. So that's how quick it goes. And everything that is happening in the developing part of the world, which means that, uh, rightly so, they are growing faster, catching up with us. But that means additional, enormous pressure from the people who will move to the middle class consumption in the next decades. Then let us look to the social story. Oxfam reports 62 people own the same as half of the world, and the rich is 1%. It's more wealthy than the rest of the world. Difficult to say that this is sustainable. Nearly 800 million people are hungry. Over 2 billion suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, while over 2 billion people are obese. Less than half of the population on the globe is actually if I can say so, normal. We throw away one-third of the food we produce. Environmental story. We have an increasing evidence of climate change threat. 60% of ecosystems are already degraded or used unsustainably. One-third of soils is moderately to highly degraded due to various reasons. And we have in Europe 467, according to estimates, thousands premature death yearly due to their pollution, globally 7 million people. That is approximately 15 times more than a premature death in the car accident. Urbanization, more than 50% of urban fabric expected to exist by 2050 still needs to be built. 
It is estimated that between 2000 and 2030, developing countries would have added 400,000 square kilometers of built-up urban area, which equals to the world's build-up area in the year 2000. And this is fascinating. In the three years, 2011-13, China has used more cement than the United States in the whole 20th century when they were building US. Nearly half of the work we do will be able to be automated by the year 2055. It's the data which was revealed in the World Economic Forum. And this is the last thing which is enormously important. For the first time in human history, we face the emergence of a single, tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. We are more interconnected and interdependent than ever, which is increasing our individual and collective responsibility comparing to just one generation ago enormously. To summarize, this was published uh, two years ago in Synchronous Failure, the Emerging Casual Architecture of Global Crisis by many of authors in a world where external reserves of resources are limited and second chances are thus increasingly rare, humankind must develop the ability to proactively navigate away from this new kind of crisis, globally extensive and intersystemic, that could otherwise irreversibly degrade the biophysical and economic basis for human prosperity. Let me now go to the economic model in which we are living. First, uh, in this graph, which is very nice, one can explain what is the real problem of our development trajectory. On the horizontal axis, you have human development index. On the vertical axis, you have environmental footprint. So more developed you are, more right you are. And higher is your environmental footprint, higher you are. The dots are the countries from the world. And the dots around it red are European Union countries. We are practically all pretty high and pretty right. The green corner on the right contains all the countries on the world where people are living well within the planetary boundaries. Zero. The reason is that all the countries in development goes not straight, straight right, but up and right, increasing the footprint. And when we find out that we are in troubles, we start to go down. So the real essence of the solution of the problem lies in developed part of the world. We need to show that we are able and ready to move down. We are those who master technologies. We are those who master knowledge. By the way, our way, the way we are producing and consuming, cannot be repeated on those countries physically. It's impossible. It's theoretically impossible. So it's bound that we show that we can collectively change and they, that they can leapfrog. Erman Daly has write it. Uh, he, he's one of the authors of the thinking uh, which is a bit different. He, he wrote down the optimal scale of macroeconomy relative to its containing ecosystem. It's the critical issue to which the macroeconomics has been blind. This blindness to the cost of growth in scale is largely a consequence of ignoring throughput and has led to the problem of ecological unsustainability. What is throughput? It's entropic physical flow from nature's sources through the economy and back to the nature's sinks. And this should not be declining. Or in other words, natural capital should not be declining. Bringing the concept of throughput into the foundations of economic theory does not reduce economics to physics, but it does force the recognition of the constraints of physical law on economics. Uh, Italian ambassador already mentioned the work of the Club of Rome. Not that they will write in all the things, but in essence, in many things, they were right, even if the timing didn't happen as they have envisaged. What does that mean, what I was explaining to you? I was five years as environment commissioner fighting that environment would be jointly recognized in three pillars, economic, social, and environmental. In essence, this is wrong. It should be like that. We should, as humans, behave and respect the limits which are given to us by the ecosystems which we have. 
So that's, uh, that's a bit more complex, uh, the same thing, which was done by European Environment Agency. So energy system, food system, mobility system, policy, industry, values, technology, science, market, socio-technical systems within the ecosystems. Another quote from Dili, how do we know that throughput growth or even the GDP growth, it's not at the margin increasing yield faster than wealth, making us poorer than richer? That's the most, probably the most important story of the economy. It's called in economic theory externalities. Externalities are about costs which are existing, but we deny them. We say they are not existing. Uh, we rather shift them either to our health, either to the farmer who has less product, either which we are most happy to the next generations because they cannot complain. Here on the top you have the profit in selected sectors. If you do not count the costs connected to the natural capital, and here you have the profit of those if you count together with natural capital costs. So many of the sectors today would be in red, actually, and they are still living in profit due to the bare fact that this is not, uh, that this is not uh, fact of life. I've heard many times that whatever I was proposing, it was a kind of new cost for the economy. Why? Because we think that those costs are not existing. But in essence, those costs are existing. As I said, we are just not admitting that they are there. So there are four things which I would like that you would remember. Growth can be good or bad growth. And we actually don't know how much of the growth in the past was good growth. Second, we normally all the political world is concentrated on GDP growth rates, not on the levels. But what is in, in important for the, your life, really, is the level, not the rate. I will ask you a simple question. Would you prefer to be somebody who earns 100 euros and it's growing 10% or somebody who earns 1,000 euros and it's growing 1%? In both cases, you have 10 euros additionally in your pocket at the end of the year. But when you go to the shop, you can't buy with growth rates. So it's extremely important that sometimes we focus rather on the, on the other problems than on the growth story as such. So distribution, at least in developed part of the world, it's probably even more important issue. We will deal majority, majority of the time only with flows. While we don't deal with the stocks and we do not know how much we are actually indebting ourselves via the whole ecosystem story. And uh, that is, uh, we have, a, we have a, a start, when it, comes to the, uh, when it comes to the budgetary deficit, we have in Europe strict rules which are saying, if you cross 3%, then the whole procedure starts, and uh, then the country is punished. We have seen nice examples in Europe how this, uh, how this works. If we are indebting in the context of taking the stock from the future generations, are we punished? Not. We are rewarded by higher profit. And we are running in that way. And that's basically how the economy currently runs. And just remember, then 10 percentage growth, it's doubling of everything in seven years. Or put it in other words, growing 7 percent, it's doubling of everything in 10 years. So uh, in the mid-term, except in specific cases, resource shortage will not be the core limiting factor of our economic development. But the environmental consequences caused by the excessive and irresponsible use of resources will be. One transparency, one slide is actually missing. We are living in a world where we have overvaluated financial capital, undervaluated labor capital, and not valuated in many cases natural capital at all. We are sending those signals into our markets where price quantity of course, works where us, consumers and producers, act rationally. And then we are surprised that we are living in a world which is in economic, social, and environmental imbalance. So it is, this is the theory which we are defending in, in International Resource Panel. 
Human well-being can grow faster than economic activity, but economic activity should grow faster than the resource use. So resources maybe can still grow, but slower than the economic activity. That means that a relative decoupling of growth happened. But if the resource use is lower, which should be the case for the developed part of the world, while the economic activity is still positive, we call it absolute decoupling. But both resources and economic activity should decouple from environmental impact, which is called Im uh, impact or environmental decoupling, if you would wish so. So when we are talking about sustainable, inclusive, equitable, low carbon, circular, green, resource efficient, and so on, and I can continue, what we actually talk about. We talk about that new economic model based on sustainable consumption and production, integrating all pillars of sustainability is necessary and unavoidable, and that we simply have to fix a broken compass. Let me now tell you uh, shortly, very shortly about the role of the circular economy. This is the famous Ellen MacArthur butterfly. On the left side, you have biotic resources. On the right side, you have abiotic resources. I'm currently dealing a lot how to strengthen the left wing of the, of the butterfly, how to produce some of the things in a, uh, in a way that you replace some abiotic with biotic materials. But what is more important is that you understand circular economy in a way that this is an economy in which we try to keep resources as long as possible in the production and consumption cycle and keep their value high as possible. So recycle, which you have heard today already many times, it's the worst of the best. Before that, there are many other things like collection, maintaining, prolonging life, reusing, redistributing, refurbishing, remanufacturing. You can do it by designing the product in a different way. You can do it by designing the production system in a different way. You can do it by trying to influence on the consumption habits of the citizens. You can do it by introducing new business models. There is no clear recipe which would work in one environment. Each one has to define what works best in his environment. I'm also working uh, with systemic. We have done analysis when we compared the current system with the future circular system, and the results are pretty simple. Green, it's, uh, it's circular. Uh, this is uh, current economic system. Household disposable income increases, GDP increases, uh, costs per household decrease, social costs decrease, CO2 emissions decrease, and primary material consumption decreases. So macroeconomic story, it's pretty straightforward and simple. We have also identified uh, major investment opportunities in circular economy in the next, uh, till 2025, actually. It is in the midterm, where we identified three sectors in mobility, four sectors in food, and three sectors in built environment. Estimated also, uh, we estimated also investments which are needed, and these are the examples which are also existing. This is just if somebody of you would like to go more in depth into those questions. So speed of transition depends on the creation of knowledge, on the incentives to innovation, on product design, on consumers' behavior, on business model sharing, moving from products to services, and so on. So some are saying that I'm actually selling the gloom and doom to the world. But let us look. Uh, by the way, I lived uh, in two commissions where our major uh, narrative was growth and jobs. The narrative of this commission is jobs and growth. So if they are serious about changing the order, that's already a good sign. But we are still connecting the both together. But let us look to the growth rates with the classical economic system in Europe in the last five decades. 60s, 5.4, 70s, 3.8, 80s, 3.1, 90s, 2.3. First decade of this century, 1.4, and we are currently approximately 0.9 in this decade. Is this a success of the policies in the past? So who is actually selling gloom and doom? Because what I'm talking about is, in essence, the new opportunities of new innovation cycle which we should uh, we should uh, focus on. So any global transition, it's a major new opportunity for the innovation, new development opportunities, new jobs, and alternative 
Frankly, I would rather not think and talk about it because it's gloom and doom. Finally, about the leadership and the governance and the role of the European Union. This is a bit untraditional uh, chapter belonging here. Why I will talk about it? Because I personally believe that if there is no leadership and no right governance, you can just dream. So I will, I will present you four quotations from people who, whom I believe that they have best captured in which situation we are currently. This is from the dawn of the system leadership by three authors. We face a host of systemic challenges beyond the reach of existing institutions and their hierarchical authority structures. Problems like climate change, destructions of ecosystems, growing scarcity of water, youth unemployment, immediate poverty and inequality require unprecedented collaboration among different organizations, sectors, even countries. We are the beginning of the beginning. How to catalyze and guide systemic change at a scale commensurate with the scale of problems we face and all of us see but dimly. Second, her, Mr. Harari, at least liberals, awaking from the long dream, the fact that Western elites are waking from their dream of the end of the history may actually increase our chances of confronting global problems successfully. Part of that dream was the notion that these elites know best what is good for the humanity. The coming years might well be characterized by intense soul searching and by attempts to formulate new social and political visions. Next from Mr. Mumford, what is needed is reconstruction of both our science and our techniques in such a fashion as to insert the rejected parts of the human personality at every stage of the process. This means gladly sacrificing mere quantity in order to restore qualitative choice, shifting the seat of authority from the mechanical collective to the human personality and the autonomous group, favoring variety and ecological complexity instead of stressing undue uniformity and standardization. And finally, this is from Stephen Hawking a year ago. It was based on the response to Brexit and, uh, and uh, elections in the United States. This was a cry of anger of people who felt they had been abandoned by their leaders. What matters now, far more than choices made by these two electorates, is how the elites react. Should we in turn reject these votes as outpourings of crude populism that fail to take account of the facts and attempt to circumvent or circumscribe the choices that they have represent, this would be a terrible mistake. The concerns underlying these votes about the economic consequences of globalization and accelerating technological change are absolutely understandable. We are living in a world of widening, not diminishing, financial inequality in which many people can see not just their standard of living, but their ability to earn a living at all disappearing. So what you need to be a leader is first, helping people see the larger system and build a shared understanding of complex problems. Second, fostering reflection and more generative conversations and last, shifting the collective focus from a reactive problem solving to co-creating the future. One thing which, uh, this is one slide about the governance, which it's also extremely important. It is based on the TED talk of uh, Marco Steinberg. Governments should be structured around the problems. Currently, they are not structured around the problems. Transport minister cannot solve the mobility problem. Agricultural minister cannot solve the food system problem. They are structured right sectors, and we are still living in silos times. And integration of that, we are trying many times, but it's pretty naturally that all of us in public administration are defending uh, our part of importance in that structure. Second, we need to move policy from innovative parts to innovative holes 
Many innovative parts do not create innovative holes, and no one in the government is looking at the big picture. I've been enough time at national and also European government that I can, that I can uh, say that this is absolute true. Third, administrative endeavor should be changed to a creative endeavor. Danger of administrative approach is that you are improving wrong solutions to ideal stage. And this is many times in public administration happening. Embedding a new capability, engaging everybody and the ownership. We have to replace the complainants box with ideas box. We should aim at impossible projects and force ourselves to rethink the principles. In short, we need a new structure, a new logic, a new culture, a new social contract. Global, why I'm mentioning now SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, because this is for the first time a real global leadership, if we will deliver. And in that context, we have to understand that sustainable consumption and production is the most efficient strategy to avoid trade-offs and create synergies to resolve the development and environmental challenges articulated in the SDGs. So, focus on sustainable consumption and production. If we will not change economic system, we can dream about the rest. It's no way. So, implementation in the, of the SDGs in Europe, we called that before, so societal challenges should be through defining research and implementation agenda, monitoring delivery, and at the end, connecting that to the innovation business case, which is, to a large extent, connecting it to also to the circular economy story. European Union, where are we currently? Despite some remarkable steps forward and resilience, which would be unthinkable before the storm struck, none of the complex and uh, interlinked crises that have buffeted the Union have been structurally resolved, and EU and its member states are suffering from the collateral damage caused by the poly crisis. These are all the crises with which we are currently in Europe dealing. But whenever one would be in doubt, is cooperating and sticking together in the European Union worth of our efforts, then always go back to the basics. And the basics is this. From the 16th century, in black, the areas of time when there were major conflicts among original EU member states and in white when they were not. And here it's when European Union started to function. Why I'm mentioning actually that? Because from the point of view of global governance, what we have achieved in Europe, we should absolutely be proud of. We are the only part of the world where 28 countries have voluntarily decided to give up some of our responsibilities to join it on higher level so that we manage bigger problems like the war and peace. By the way, the world is currently standing pretty much on the same crossroad. Either we will join to govern it together because we are so interconnected globally. At the end of the day, it's about conflicts and war and peace. And I hope we understand that and the circular economy is the way how to keep the overall economic system bearable in the so quickly growing population and expanding middle class. To conclude, main points I would like you to remember. For the first time in the human history, we face emergence of a single, tightly coupled human, social, ecological system of planetary scope. It is about system change. Without leadership and improved global governance, SDGs are only a wishful thinking. Transition to a new economic model, integrating all pillars of sustainability should be in the center of our attention. Trade-offs among various SDGs are unavoidable, but sustainable consumption and production is the most efficient strategy to avoid them and create synergies. Proper valuation of natural capital is essential part of the transition and circular economy, it's a good concept to operationalize it in practice. Implementing SDGs taking into account specific national circumstances and competitive advantages should be priority of the government 
defined in the strategic document, supported by indicators, monitoring, reported, reporting, linked to the core economic policy decisions. All economic policies should be systematically adjusted. Synergies among climate change and resource management circular economy should be exploited. All levels, global, European, national, local, and all stakeholders, public, private, financial sector, civil society, academia, should actively participate in the system change. Active dialogue with potential losers is necessary to make the transition possible. If we are to avoid globally extensive and intersystemic crises and frequent conflicts, then let's get serious about implementing what we have agreed in SDGs. Changes are unavoidable and humans are supposed to be intelligent and it is high time to prove it. We should refocus our policy attention from addressing consequences, migration, security, to addressing resources, leading to them, economic model, social, environmental imbalances. Europe should stay in the lead. European Union is the best global governance pilot, an enormous wealth of good and bad examples in practice, but there is a need for a clear vision and leadership which is currently lacking. Will it be easy when Albert Einstein was asked why it is that mankind has stretched so far as to discover the structure of the atom, but we have not been able to devise the political means to keep the atom from destroying us, he replied, that is simple, my friend, it is because politics is more difficult than physics. <laughs> and the last transparency, I have heard from many people that this is a very nice long-term story, but we should focus on the things which are currently bothering us. And my reply to them would be, the future has already arrived and it is called present. Thank you. <laughs>